Welcome to the seventh Maddingley Lecture. Um, the Maddingley Lectures are the University's Institute of Continuing Education's public lecture series here at Maddingley Hall. I'm Rebecca Lingwood, the director of the Institu Institute, and I'd like to take the opportunity firstly to introduce our chair for this evening, Dr. Ron Zimmern, so that he may introduce our speaker, the Vice-Chancellor, um, and also to chair the questions at the end of the lecture. Ron Zimmern has enjoyed a distinguished career in medicine and public health and is the pioneer of public health genomics in the UK. After medical training in Cambridge and London, Ron specialised in neurology and entered public health medicine in 1983. If that weren't enough, in the 1980s he also completed a law degree and developed a lasting interest in law and ethics in medicine. He was Director of Public Health for Cambridge and Huntingdon Health Authority from 1991 to 1998, and in 1997 established the Public Health Genetics Unit and is now chairman of its successor, the PHG Foundation. Ron heads a team of working internationally in areas spanning genetics, epidemiology, law, social sciences, ethics, and knowledge management. So just before I hand over to Ron, if I could just remind you that if you've brought your mobile, mobile phones this evening, now's the point to switch them off. So thank you. Welcome, Ron Zimmern. Thank you, Rebecca. It is a great honor and privilege um, for me to be asked to introduce um, our Vice-Chancellor, uh, Selezek Borisiewicz, or Boris as he sometimes prefers to be known, is extremely distinguished. Um, I first came across him when he was a lecturer in medicine here in the field of infectious diseases, but um, Cambridge was too small a place for him, and within very few years, he um, went to, um, left Cambridge, uh, got a chair in Cardiff, um, from which, uh, as a result of his research, he was knighted for his work on um, human papillomavirus. He then left Cardiff and became chief executive of the, um, uh, by way, uh, to be chief executive of uh, the MRC by way of being the principal of the Faculty of Medicine at University College in London. So our vice chancellor has seen it all from different sides, different perspectives, from the perspective of the NHS, from the perspective of the research councils. But above all, besides that, he has a passion for global health. And I know that he is very keen to put Cambridge um, on the map as a place where global health will um, really flourish and research in global health will flourish. So we look forward very much to his lecture. I'm sure it will be very stimulating. And this is an absolutely splendid time for such a lecture to take place because not a month or two ago in the middle of September, the United Nations actually at the General Assembly produced, uh, I think, 13 page political declaration on the prevention and control of non-communicable disease globally. It is seen as a huge threat. So Boris, thank you very much. Thank you. The challenges of global health. Um, in the midst of life, there is death. And whatever doctors will do, that's where we're all going to end up. This is Peter Bruegel's view of the triumph of death, and it has been interpreted as a picture in two ways. It's a very allegorical setting, which uh, actually epitomizes what is actually often seen on nectarian funerary jars in uh, ancient Greece. And it has been interpreted in one of two ways in a typical Bruegel-esque way. Firstly, this is the consequence of climate change, i.e. the end of world as we know it and that in essence, all of mankind is being eradicated in the context uh, of death. The only thing that's wrong with that interpretation, and this is a personal view, not an art historian's view, that's what the Prado Guide will tell you, is if that was the case, 
then why do we actually see all the grisly forms of demise of execution in the right-hand corner? What it does say is that life in the Middle Ages was short and rather brutish. And unfortunately, one of the ways in which that demise occurred is epitomized in the way that the figure of death in the bottom uh, right -hand, uh, left hand corner, as you uh, look at it, is actually leading a plague cart. So in the face of all of these grisly ways in which you could beat your maker in the Middle Ages, plague carried a particular connotation, even in 1562, which is actually nearly 200 years after this particular event of plague in, the, in Europe. Now, the reason I pick this particular uh, episode is it tells us that even in the Middle Ages, we were dealing with a global world. We, don't, we talk about infectious diseases today as being something which can easily be transmitted through airplane travel. It took a bit longer, but if you have a damn good pathogen, it will be just as effective on a slower time scale um, in the plague of, that occurred in the middle of the 14th century. In essence, where we can mark the timings of the various uh, elements, it certainly seemed to come via the Black Sea, spread across uh, Marseille, uh, actually there's a classical landing of the boat in the, the Provence regions, and you can see the cascades uh, of plague that then moved northwards. And the further north it moved, the clues we get to the etiology is that it died down in the winter and flared up again in the summer, which actually is a cyclical um, re, um, reintroduction of rats into uh, a variety uh, of uh, culture, into a variety of environments. Failure to engage with a major infection has huge consequences. And the consequences of something like the Black Death and failure to deal with it have political consequences even in 14th century Europe. Firstly, the major demographic change that happened in Europe. Hugely patchy. Take North Italian cities, mortality in Florence estimated to be 45 to 75 percent of the population, Venice 60 percent, Milan virtually unaffected. Come back to that in a second. Total estimate, I think it's between 20 to 70 million people in Europe perished during that particular episode. And in many parts of Europe, I think the population didn't recover to the same numbers till the middle of the 17th century. Huge impact. Secondly, it changed trade and commerce. So it changed the way the systems work. There was long-term depletion of uh, rural populations because you needed the population in urban centers and actually, many historians would argue that it was the beginning of the end of the feudal system. So whole political systems change on single events by a failure of adequate control. And if you didn't think the feudal system was important, just consider the dominance of the church. The Catholic Church, remember, was the dominant entity. The mentality uh, that pervaded pervaded was that death or disease was a consequence of the ill life in which you led. There was a consequence that was uh, linked between the two. And the church basically failed the role it set itself. It said, keep praying and you'll be all right. Actually, rats get into churches. But the church had a solution. And the first public health measure that was introduced was the flagellant movement. If you can't actually uh, feel you're not doing uh, enough, then stand there and chastise yourself. Um, not a very effective public health maneuver, but it was an effort at a public health intervention. Well, when that failed, of course, it set about blaming somebody else, because the first thing you can do if you're politically motivated is to find an alternative group. And of course, there followed the persecution of the Jews. 350 documented events by historians of where you had mass burnings, executions of Jewish populations. After all, they were the murderers of Christ. If we murder them, we'll probably be all right from the plague. Uh, guess what? It didn't work. So another public health measure that you would have to say was not uh, uh, particularly effective. That sectarian violence left 
a marked stain, particularly when it, you consider the impact of this later in Central European movements, even hundreds of years later. The church hierarchy didn't remain with the affected. The popes locked themselves up in Avignon. They, the priests ran off to the priories. I mean, after all, these are supposed to be the equivalent of the medics at that time. They were supposed to tend to the sick. What happened is the public lost respect for closed orders, but open orders of friars were widely welcomed. Interestingly, the mortality of friars was equivalent to the population at about 40%. Closed orders was 15%. So maybe as a public health measure, the priests knew something the friars didn't get out of the, uh, out of the system. After the uh, Black Death passed over, there was some recovery in the social position of the church. But according to many historians, Ziegler amongst them, it never achieved the same level of respect within society. And he has argued that this actually set up the, uh, the framework within which the Reformation could thrive. Could be an exaggeration, could be an extrapolation. But an interesting perspective that a disease and failure to deal with a disease can destroy a society, can destroy the precepts on which that society is built, and can destroy the whole economic system. Can it happen today? Well, we don't know. I'll come to that in a second. Another public health measure, um, questionable whether this worked. Um, this was the medic's personal protection that you've seen uh, parodied, and if you go to Venice, to the Carnivale, you will actually see it uh, there today. But this beak was stuffed full of herbs, and the idea was that in some way you would avoid the, uh, the, the death itself. I think what was probably more effective was that the doctor, you will notice, uh, wearing this garb, and there were some real prescriptions as to this garb, didn't actually touch the patient. He touched them with that long stick. Um, so physical examination wasn't a prerequisite of physicians of the Middle Ages. But some measures did work. And one of the things that is suggested that in Milan, why only three households fell ill with the plague, was as soon as they were identified, they were walled off as a whole family in their houses. Um, maybe that might do with foot and mouth disease in the United Kingdom. I don't think it would be acceptable. But what then happened was we began to develop the concept of pest houses to isolate individuals with the plague. It didn't totally work because, of course, we now know there's an animal vector involved. And then there was the other measure, which was a pretty final measure. That's the standard hand cart that you were carted away on and the uh, archaeological remains of pest pits that you had around Europe. The idea put lime on it and actually stopped the pest spreading from there. It's a pretty final public health measure, but nonetheless was deemed at the time to be really important. Now, it could not control this particular disease for reasons that we now know, but it's only down to these pest houses that a matter of uh, a month ago in Nature, we were found a report from the East Smithfield uh, pest uh, plague pit, um, which was a particularly important one, because what was known archaeologically is this pit was only used between 16, uh, 1348 and 1350. And the people that were buried in that pit did not come from the, uh, uh, the further plagues that occurred in London thereafter. It was closed at 1350. Uh, you can see the uh, uh, excavations that occurred, but the good news for modern biologists was that the people who were buried there were quite young, and believe it or not, they had good teeth. And if you've got good teeth, you can drill through them today, extract the DNA, and finally, we now know definitively that it was Yersinia pestis that was the cause of the plague. So all the other theories can now be more or less put to bed, and boy, have they abounded over the centuries. The isolation of this uh, is particularly important. It's been sequenced, and we now know that those sequences represent a divergence in Yersinia pestis that occurred about that time when it's extrapolated backwards by Bayesian methods to between somewhere between 1311 to 1347 that it actually occurred. But the beautiful thing for those interested in the impact of medicine on history was it now does not explain the great plague of Justinian in the 6th century because all the divergent strains of Yersinia pestis came from that archetypal breakdown 
all the strains that are known to infect man occurred subsequent to this date. That's the paradigm. And therefore, we have no idea what the Justinian plague was caused by. Those of you who are interested in early Byzantine history will, of course, know that the Justinian plague was probably the ultimate cause of the fall of the Roman Empire coming from, from the east, and that remains a mystery. So there's a, with one mystery solved, another one arises. But, play, but Yersinia may not be the organism responsible. So fascinating. Today, does it happen? That's 2003, 20 million dead, 42 million more infected, 15,000 newly infected cases each day, reduction in lifespan. Don't believe it? This is the impact of HIV on the projected population structure of South Africa in 2020. You can compare the pyramid, which is the actual projected growth uh, population pyramid in green as to where it would have been in blue if it hadn't been for the advent of HIV. So modern plagues still have the capacity to change the demography and potentially change the nature uh, of responses thereafter. Let me turn to a different painter, Edward Monk. Edward Monk was an individual who was severely depressed for much of his life but he obsessed on a particular vision. At the age of 15, he witnessed the death of his sister. And if you are interested in this particular picture, which is in the National Gallery, I can tell you there are six other versions he painted in his life. There are at least 27 different lithographs of the same scene. He also painted his mother at the dying chamber of his sister, and she died almost certainly of consumption. You can actually see in this picture, he depicts something which many of us who've witnessed individuals who suffer from consumption, that pallid, waxy color that you actually see on the skin of somebody uh, in uh, the last throes of tuberculosis. You can palpably feel the grief of the parent. And at the same time, you can see in the lower right-hand corner a lurid pink <coughs> mixture probably completely ineffective in the management of the disease, yet the faith that the two of them are placing in this completely ineffective medication. It's a scene that leaves you really wondering how common this was. This is the average mortality in London from 1847 to 1850, taken from all of the local public health reports, where post-mortems and other um, methods of ascertainment occurred from the known causes of death. Tuberculosis was carrying off 16% of all known causes of death. Forget the other infectious diseases. It's huge. Yet, the epidemic of tuberculosis was past its peak. In reality, tuberculosis was probably at its highest at about the time of Jenner at the turn of the 19th century. In those rural, idyllic scenes of Constable, was where tuberculosis was at the highest, not in Blake's dark satanic mills at all. The interesting thing about tuberculosis is, of course, that we have studied it and looked at it for a long time. And here on a logarithmic scale, you can see tuberculosis mortality rates from 1900 to 1995 in a variety of countries. And I just want to focus a little on this chart and what it actually tells us. Firstly, it tells us any social upheaval will result in increased rates. These are, in these countries, the impact of the two world wars. There's no doubting that that was important. So anything which actually causes a problem in the environment, an upheaval in nutrition, will actually cause a rise in tuberculosis rates. And that is repeated time and time again today. Secondly, screening was introduced as X-ray screening through this period. Every time we hear a case of tuberculosis, what do we hear on the media? Let's reintroduce X-ray screening for everybody who comes in through the airport. Well, 
Archie Cochran would have had something to say about it. Garbage, complete and utter waste of time. They tried it for the best part of 50 years, and a study, dare I say, from Cardiff in 1948 finally nailed this particular one, that it's of no value whatsoever in overall prevention once the prevalence drops below about 3% of the population. Waste of time. But publicly, very visible, and quite liked by the public, because you can actually spot them coming in, can't you? You can do something about it. Then there was the BCG vaccination program from, of UNICEF and WHO. Every child was to get BCG. This was a prevention for tuberculosis. Look at where those arrows are located. Don't you think the trend in tuberculosis deaths was already falling long before the uh, UNICEF and WHO programs were introduced? Hailed as a huge success at the time, actually no evidence whatsoever that the program did anything to control what was already a falling trend and probably due to far better nutrition and other uh, interventions on a far global scale, more global scale than a BCG vaccination program. What happens now when we get a case? Oh, bring back BCG. Why don't we have this in schools? Nobody wants to look at where the evidence actually points. But the threat of tuberculosis is very real. You will see these are the estimated TB incidence rates by country, but you will also see that it is geographically restricted to many areas. But partial treatment, poor treatment, and the spread of resistance is now rampant. And this drug-resistant tuberculosis is not largely a problem of Africa. It's a problem of the former Soviet Union, of particularly the Baltic states where it is now receding, um, where for a variety of reasons this appears to spread. This particular study to me is one of the seminal studies that were uh, being carried out using modern methodology. Where in cases in South Africa, what we found was it was not under treatment, but almost certainly reinfection with the XDR tuberculosis that was the primary cause. In other words, we're dealing with a different type of infection, not just poor treatment. Poor treatment might have allowed that infection to start, but in the right environment, this bug will spread just as effectively as other forms of tuberculosis. And the treatment options are XDR, we're back to surgery, collapsing the lung, actually doing exactly what would have been done at 1900 or in 1847 as things that were thought to be effective. The drugs are not particularly effective. So we've learned very few lessons. We have public policy. We need to control tuberculosis. It's still there. It's still with us and causing problems. Drug resistance has appeared. On that uh, multiple drug resistant tuberculosis, almost certainly due to um, resistance to a currently used agent, but the very drug resistant, we haven't got any effective intervention today. And I'm afraid what we require is a vaccine. So where I'm coming from is that the questions that the public health world faces in terms of infectious diseases, it can impact directly on populations, it can have huge societal consequences, and the nature of the interventions very often still have to remain very disease-specific. Let's move on a little now to consider the changing face of global health. I focused on two infectious diseases. I've shown you how those will actually vary geographically, and I, can sh I hope I've shown you how the threat of, threat of spread can still produce a global impact. But I now want to turn to the changing healthcare problems. This is data from Srinath Reddy on the estimated mortality in India from selected causes in 2004. If you're planning the future health of the world, would you focus on infectious and parasitic diseases? It's the data in 2004. Well, let's exclude that group. That's trauma and pregnancy. There are ways of trying to reduce the mortality from those causes, but they're not directly going to be impacted on the, in, in the medical world. These have got nothing to do with infectious diseases. And if you add them up, by 2004, 
far from the widely held view that the WHO was promoting at the time, actually focus on HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis, already the coin had flipped in that the non-communicable diseases are, even in a country like India, far more important than deaths from infectious diseases. And I feel quite confident, as somebody who specialised in infectious diseases, I can say that without my colleagues howling me down. What are the really attributable factors associated with mortality in India? High blood pressure, suboptimal su uh, uh, blood glucose control, low fruit and vegetable intake, tobacco use, high cholesterol, indoor smoke from solid fuels. Thankfully, that isn't one that we've got, but is a very important cause of chronic lung disease, physical inactivity, overweight and obesity, and alcohol use. Oh gosh, I'm talking about India. I could be talking about North London. The projected deaths and burden of disease in India are really even more telling. These are the deaths, as you would expect, in 2030. The total burden of infectious disease in a country such as India is going to be there. This is the burden of disease in that population that it faces in 2030. So in planning a global health campaign, dare I say the impact of infectious diseases will recede. It will always be a risk because of the changing nature of the organism, but the world has got to focus on this problem. And if you convert this into disability life years, it is even starker. This is what is costing economies of countries uh, and countries' productivity uh, a real harm, uh, problem for the future. This is why countries will not be able to move forward in terms of education or in delivery of economic or food production. So chronic diseases are a worldwide problem, certainly not a problem of just developed countries. This sort of concept that these diseases are something to be done uh, only down to affluence, we now know that they're 60% of all deaths worldwide, and more importantly, 80% of all deaths from these conditions occur to, in low to medium income countries. And 44% of all preventable deaths, twice the number of preventable deaths due to infectious diseases, Can we reduce the 36 million premature deaths by 2015? Well, we probably can. And this was a paper that we published to analyze what could be done. And it is rather telling, because now medics don't figure in this at all. Firstly, you have to raise public awareness that this is a problem, because actually the public health intervention has now changed from a passive intervention such as a vaccine or cleaning up the water supply to having to do something about it yourself. Economic, legal, and environmental policies are vital, so governments need to, to take action. They can't just abdicate this to free will and market forces. You need to modify risk factors because that's the best that we can do at present. And both business and community will have to take responsibility in societal terms for reducing this impact. <coughs> Health inequalities, something that has still plagued us since Black's time, and I don't think anyone's got any greater solutions, although we've restated the problem probably 150 times over, if not more, in terms of volume after volume published on health inequalities. Total impact of intervention, probably zero. And we need to reorientate health systems, particularly in low-income uh, countries, which are totally orientated to infectious diseases. And boy, have we better get moving on reorientating those health systems towards the management of chronic disease. And the progress, well, and hence we formed the Global Alliance for Non-Communicable Diseases and put some resources into countries to be able to start examining the nature of this problem. And global challenges and health coexist. Uh, Reverend Thomas Malthus, an essay on the principle of population. Fascinating man. Just one quote. That the power of population is indefinitely greater than that of the power in the earth to produce subsistence for man. Population, when unchecked, increases in a geometric ratio subsistence increases only in an arithmetical ratio. Uh, 
or as I tend to see it, it basically means that. And that you end up with a point of crisis, the Malthusian crisis point, where you might end up with a problem that the population outstrips the resources. Is that Bruegel's picture that we were actually seeing in 1562? Well, we may be moving towards a Malthusian crisis. I happen to be an optimist. I don't think we are, because Malthus underestimated one thing, and that's the ingenuity of man to increase resources. But we have to be careful, because we're coming to the end of the time when we can actually increase those resources indefinitely. So population growth, you've all seen that figure. Everybody puts that figure up. It basically says 9 billion people by 2040 to 2050. They don't tell you is that the projection after 2050 is that that population will fall. The 9 billion is a blip. The factor that will determine whether it is 9 billion and continues at 9 billion is a single country policy, and that is whether China sustains its one-child policy. You might not think that, again, a single country can impact on a global population figure as much as one country can. So some optimism that, in reality, that will control itself if we can manage that 9 billion population for a period of time. But factors Malthus did not consider are life expectancy, dependency and location, certainly didn't consider climate change, and didn't consider constraints on man's ingenuity to increase production. This graph is one of the most telling graphs and particularly worrying for the chief economist of Japan. It's a graph which predicts the probability at a given time that one-third of the population will be over the age of 60. Everything so far indicates that those projections are of 2008 are absolutely spot on. And Japan is going to be the first country that is going to have to deal with this issue of dependency. Western Europe will not be far behind. England will be there first. Scotland will be there sometime thereafter, largely because the way they eat Mars bars is actually very effectively taking the uh, edge off the top end of the population. <laughs> Urbanization is also changing. We need increased productivity from the rural environment. This is what low-income countries and less developed regions are going to experience. What we're seeing is a substantial movement into large urban cities. So far, we think Shanghai is big. Just think what it's going to look like when Shanghai and Beijing actually merge into one suburbia. We worry about Southeast England being overpopulated and already beginning to look like Holland. Just imagine when that extends to Birmingham and beyond. The suburbanization of populations is great, but remember that's going to require increased productivity from what remains in the rural area to sustain those urban areas. Climate change, I'm sorry, I'm a complete nihilist. This is going to happen. All we can do is to prevent it getting much worse. Um, what will happen to Cambridge when the water level rises one and a half meters? I don't know, but maybe Mattingly is going to be actually the very best place to be um, at that time. So maybe this hall may have a different function for the university in 30 to 40 years' time. But with the rising temperatures, what we're seeing is a critical concern on the drylands and their productivity. These have the lowest levels of human uh, well-being. 10 to 20% of drylands are already degraded, and they have only 8% of renewable water supply left. We might worry about feeding the population. The crisis with fresh water and potable water supplies is going to hit us long before that will. And our Earth is shrinking. This is how good agriculture has actually become. And this slide, I think, is one of the best slides NERC has ever produced. What it basically tells us is how many hectares of land per person were available from 1900 to 2050. And we are continually increasing the productivity through better agricultural systems, through better um, innovation than was actually being achieved in 1900 on all those hectares. <coughs> 
Again, please remember the idyllic vision of the Constable Village and the hay fields and all the rest of it that we all want to aspire to and retire to and everything else was the place where tuberculosis was rife and was inefficient in any form of food production. It's not as idyllic as it's painted in the pictures. But this is a real challenge. How do you maintain productivity? And if I really want to worry you further, and goodness me, you should be getting really depressed by now, we are struggling to keep up. These are figures taken from The Economist, an excellent uh, book on the 9 billion people question that they actually put forward. Basically, what we're seeing is these are now looking at the rate of growth. These are not numbers that are looking at absolute growth. They're looking at the rate of growth. In other words, the acceleration of growth. The world population, in contrast to those numbers, is actually slowing. But the rate of growth of wheat production, which was at around 3% uh, per annum from 1961 to 1990, has now slowed. We're not getting the enhanced yields that are going to be necessary to feed 9 billion people from the standard staples that we rely on today. And if you think that this doesn't really matter, then look at the commodity price index for food in The Economist. Now, we all know that that sudden rise from 2007 to 8 was the introduction, was the presence in wheat of a single suddenly susceptible rust that in infected wheat and therefore reduced productivity. That's the spike. What should worry all of us is that the underlying trend of the commodity food price index has been rising quite steadily. Okay, it seems to be spiking again. Wheat as a crop is amazing. An octoploid crop that in essence has been resistant to everything since Mesopotamian times and has fed the world. It's a complete miracle that this crop has not been infected by every pathogen known, to, uh, known uh, in the plant kingdom, and yet it sustained us extremely well. It's also a very difficult crop to manipulate because of the octoploid uh, genome. Is this going to be the solution? I often show this slide and ask, what do you see? And somebody will say, tomato. I see a new vaccine delivery system. But the question here is, is if we manipulate crops, who do we trust to be able to deliver it for benefit rather than for straight profit? And will it impact on political differences in systems? So lastly, I want to turn to the development of healthcare systems. I said that we will need to adjust, particularly in low-income countries, the nature of healthcare systems. Now, there are predictable public health issues that require measures by all governments. Make no bones about it. If I had a single wish, I would wipe out Philip Morris, BAT, Imperial Tobacco, and frankly, anyone who holds any shares in all, any of those companies because they have not exerted shareholder instance. They are peddling nothing but death and toxins. There is no benefit to tobacco in any shape or form to anyone anywhere in the world. It, frankly, is the single crop that should be eradicated off the planet. There we are. I've said my bit. <laughs> this is what the Chinese government is doing instead. This is the product of domestic cigarettes in China, uh, given to me by Richard Pito, who's always got an interesting graph or two. That's what's happened to the Chinese tobacco industry when they know full well, right back in 1954, what the long-term consequences of cigarette consumption by their uh, population is going to do. The latest adverts in China, Chinese tobacco is safer than American tobacco. How many times, Ron, have we heard that in the public health domain? These projections that Richard has been calculating, if you look at tobacco smoking in different years here for Chinese men as to how many the average number of cigarettes consumed per individual or per man in the Chinese column per day actually is. The consequence is that 40 years after the US increase, China is going to experience the same increase. In 1990, 33% of all deaths in the United States could be attributed in whole or in part to cigarette smoking. It's now fallen quite dramatically. China, 
that number will hit 33% in 2030. Um, almost as predictable as night follows day. Can something be done about it? Simple. This is France. Cigarette consumption rising into the, the 1990s together with consequences in lung cancer. That's the cigarette consumption in France per adult per day. They'd still like to smoke in France. When prices were raised by taxation, you can see what happened to cigarette consumption. Don't tell me that governments can't do something about it if they have a will to actually change behavior. Now, improved delivery of healthcare does impact on disease. There are several fallacies which say it, they can't, you can't make a significant difference. This data, again, comes from the Oxford group, which actually looks at this quite dramatic fall in the death rate per 100,000 women from breast cancer. We're often told you need some sort of public health measure. There isn't a single discovery that has occurred in breast cancer research that would have accounted for that fall. The reason that fall has occurred was because what we've learned is to deliver healthcare better in breast cancer and increasing patient demand from women that actually they will not get involved in a postcode lottery. The problem is, when we know things like that work, we're not investing in those because we want to get into fancier and fancier methods uh, of treatment. And that's the challenge for public health of today. Can you deliver something that is effective? And then we must turn, in global health terms, to what I would term the Obama headache. That is US expenditure as percentage of GDP on health care, now hitting over 16% of GDP. By, uh, in 2007, 2008. Can you tell me any country in the world that is going to ever be able to follow that level of expenditure? And certainly any low-income country can ever aspire to that sort of expenditure on healthcare. It is completely unsustainable and unrealistic. And what you end up with is this global inequality of life expectancy. Now, before you immediately rush off to your travel agents and book tickets for Afghanistan, that is actually black because we have no data for Afghanistan. So it's not the place with the greatest life expectancy, but I couldn't get the projection in any different color. So please don't do that. It's actually got a very short life expectancy. So short it's probably not measurable. So those inequalities are the inequalities that we're faced with day in, day out, if you want to deliver a better, healthier, and fairer world. And don't tell me, and nor would anybody should say, that if you don't earn more as a country, you don't live longer. This is life expectancy and annual income. And if you want an equitable world, please tell me where on that graph equity actually exists. And that sort of graph means that if these countries move along with greater expenditure but don't think how to improve life expectancy and just move in that direction, then things will not improve. And countries in danger of doing that are those actually that have a very high um, index of wealth because they're actually getting things out of the ground like Botswana but a falling population in terms uh, of, of the impact of HIV and other diseases. So some real challenges there. You'll notice South Africa, very prominent among those countries. So let's not have that. But then let's look at this uh, graph from David Leon. This looks at the per capita uh, total health expenditure in 1997 in US dollars and the impact on life expectancy at birth in 1999. All these 70 countries, and the reason he chose 70 countries, had WHO validated data on life expectancy and on expenditure. So this is as rock solid data as you can get in this sort of world. And what you can see is that it's a double kinetic curve. It's got a sort of plateau at the top and actually an, uh, uh, a rise if you actually follow it. In other words, there are two equations that actually govern the nature of that curve. And let's break those two apart. We have one vector in that direction, which I would argue 
is largely due to the optimum growth, which is limited by discovery, new interventions, and biology. Finally, you can't live to infinity. Bruegel was right at the end of the day. The end is probably grisly. Um, let's just delay it as long as possible. The second is that line. And what's that driven by? Totally economically unsustainable, but it's consumer-driven and politically expedient. Which do you want? Because in democracies, you've got the right to decide what that expenditure should be. But I don't know anyone who's going to say, well, actually, I should be living shorter because I want to be fairer. We're now getting to some very basic human questions. So if we're going to do anything, we need to look at the countries that exist and their healthcare systems at that particular intersection. Now, I love showing this slide to Americans because when you ask them which two countries are really on the cusp, the two really bother them. Because one of them is Singapore, and the other one is actually to say Cuba, which they do not like to hear uh, in, in particular that it's doing just as well as the United States at a fraction of the cost of healthcare. So why do these countries at this point of inflection do so well? What are the characteristics of healthcare in countries at the cusp? And those countries have certain characteristics that I would conclude are as follows. These are my conclusions, and I think many better authorities than I am would be able to speak differently. They are characterized by measures where public health interventions absolutely dominate not healthcare provision interventions. Secondly, it's variable, but in some of the countries, good evidence-based intervention is what is implemented because there are limited resources. And thirdly, they're kind of rationed from the top because in those countries, the most modern interventions are frequently unavailable. And it just shows us some of those modern innovations on the population, not on an individual patient basis, are not that important. The demand is limited by cost or availability, but the position is inherently unstable. They're at that point, but frankly, they're like a molecule in space. They're going to move either left or right, but the one thing they're not going to do is to remain static. So it, the position is not something that is a position of equilibrium or balance. So in coming to draw some conclusions from what I've been saying tonight, what are the drivers for the future? I would put it to you that the recognition and the importance for global health is understanding the changing nature of human disease. Secondly, we have to understand that the environment in, and the populations are also changing. And these populations will need to be served in relationship to health care Tough decisions will have to be taken as to what that health care will be, and somebody has got to make those decisions. Thirdly, the wider context of health care has to be seen in the context of major global challenges that we will face in the next 30, 40 years. Population rise, climate change, all of these will impact, and food supply. My own view is that improvement in global health is going to be largely dependent on a system that's based entirely on prevention for many countries. I would wish to be able to say that you could introduce radiotherapy in uh, Uganda to, to treat all of the cancers that are there. You can't. And therefore, you've got to try to go for the best preventative strategies that you can. And I think it is going to be very important that a strong public health perspective is brought to bear so that most effective use is made of every dollar that is available for the better delivery of health care. I think it is going to be dependent on the provision of services by disciplines other than health care. Health care is going to take its place in the complete panoply of everything from security to uh, other issues that face particularly finance ministries. My own view is that there is a place for technology, but the technology has to be adaptive and has to be affordable in those countries for which it is intended. 
And the good news for me here is every time I go into an engineering department, I increasingly see engineers who are really interested in using the simplest forms of technology for the future. They no longer are very proud of the fastest Formula One car or something of that sort that used to pervade, certainly when I first started looking at engineering departments. I think that really is good news. And I think health services will have to adapt to the changing nature of prevalent disease in different societies so that the healthcare system will have to change and it will have to continually change and there will be no such thing as an absolutely perfect health service for any country. It will have to adapt as the population adapts, as the environment changes and as the prevalence of different diseases uh, uh, occurs. And now comes the big but. Patient-led demand is infinite. Ron certainly experienced that in spades here in, uh, in Cambridge, and I'm sure he'd be able to tell you about how difficult it was as a time, but he was right in the stance that he took. So who is going to say, no, you can't have it? Oregon tried. Broke down the first time a child needed a second liver transplant in Oregon because... The picture in the Daily Mail of little Mary who's come in, how on earth could your heart not go out and, and provide a treatment which is ineffective and known not to work particularly well. But you've got to give it a shot because there's a 3% chance it would work. We're all human. As a clinician, I'm totally susceptible to that every time I see a patient. Is it the right thing to do? And if so, how do you control patient demand, particularly in democratic systems? All funding models, as far as I'm concerned, will leave a disadvantaged group. If you have socialized healthcare, you will have postcode differences. If you have insurance-based care, then some group will be disadvantaged in terms of what can be provided. The question is, is what is the disadvantage you're prepared to socially accept that any healthcare system will provide? We can be as fair as we like, but believe me, if patient-led demand is infinite, we all want to live that little bit longer. We all want our families to live that little bit longer. We will do everything to break that system in order to benefit those nearest and dearest to us. And I'm sorry, I'm no angel. I will do exactly the same when I'm faced with it. And lastly, and possibly the most important statement I'm going to make tonight is leadership on health is political suicide. Just name to me one health minister in Britain whose career was enhanced by his or her stay in healthcare. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the problem of global health. Well, Vice Chancellor, thank you very much. A fascinating talk and open to questions. Uh, thank you very much. Most, most interesting and fascinating. I'm Jeremy Nunns, and I'd like to ask you, if you had a billion dollars, would you spend it on research into AIDS cures, or would you spend it on public sanitation and better water supplies? No brainer for me, public sanitation and water supply. Do you know the scale of public sanitation that would be needed by 2050? I come from a city called Cardiff, population of 350,000. You will have to provide in 2040, and I say you because I probably won't be there, um, a sanitation system for the equivalent of the population of the city of Cardiff every working day of the year in order just to deal with human waste by 2040 to 2050. Um, so I'm afraid billion dollars ain't going to go very far, but if I had it, that's what it should be spent on. A couple of years ago, The Lancet published uh, quite a critical review of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the way they spend money. Uh, I mean, they have become a major driver for particularly research around global health. I just wondered if you had a view about uh, the way in which they've engaged or not engaged with people in the direction they've taken. Okay. I'm actually quite a fan of what Bill and Melinda Gates have done. They've done two things. They kind of looked at that Bruegel picture, I think, in the first instance, and decided the one thing we can't do is take it with us. And so they have actually enhanced the consequence, particularly of taking those who have made a lot of money and deciding that it's time to give something back. And a large number of very rich philanthropists are following suit. Uh, 
The philosophy behind Bill and Melinda Gates' approach is actually that very much of an industrialist, where Bill in particular is interested only in the implementation of what is known to be effective. So his view was, I don't want a whole lot of research. What I want are vaccines we know work. I want to make sure that every child in Africa gets a chance by getting a vaccine. So where they've intervened in some of these programs, it has worked. I worked on one Bill and Melinda Gates program, which particularly related to schistosomiasis control, sort of wormy infection that gets in through, through, through water, and nobody had heard about it till I think Prince William got it when he uh, walked into a lake, then every sun reader knows about it. Um, it's eminently treatable. They were prepared to enable enough drug to be made that could actually effectively treat six whole countries. Now, I don't know the United Nations and not WHO, with all the yak yak that goes on around them, ever actually intervening in a practical sense to make a difference uh, to, to populations. So there, I am very supportive of them. What they decided was that they would focus on the infectious diseases side because they think that that is tractable based on the information we currently have, and they were probably right. The problem that's coming around now is what we're recognizing is that data from India which is how do you use the resource that they have to start intervening in these broader questions. So unfortunately, what they're dealing with is that uh, low fragment that, uh, that you saw in the 2030 graph down to infectious diseases in the main. They now have to deal with this larger problem. And the problem that they're now encountering, and they're beginning to split some of the monies that are, are going to be available to start looking at, for example, how do you deal with microloan systems, and will this actually help improve health in general? Far bigger challenge, far more expensive as to what you're likely to, uh, to, to be able to achieve than the delivery of a vaccine program. HIV needs to be dealt with. Too many young people are dying, too many dependents are being left as a result. So yeah, I'm delighted that they're prepared to put their money that way. You won't convince them to put it into sanitation and public health because their view is that, that is what the governments of those countries should be spending money on, not on AK-47s. Um, unfortunately, it's not a fair world. So I actually laud them for doing their bit with the resources available to them. I laud them that they actually are trying, which is a lot more than many other agencies around the world are. Are they getting it right? Well, if they get it 20% right, maybe there'll be a 20% improvement in some areas, and that will still be a big public health intervention. And nobody else has tried it on this scale, so worth a shot. I'm interested in the political suicide. Uh, we don't seem to have much to thank politicians for at the moment. Um, is there... I was interested in your point about prevention rather than cure and the potential impacts on the proportion of GDP that you need to spend. But presumably, if we can persuade politicians we're not infantile, there must be a graph which shows at some point that investment in prevention, public health education, and so on, is a benefit and helps us reduce the cost of, of, health, of health care. Yeah. And I suppose I ask the question partly because one of the things that the coalition government has done has laid huge cuts into public health education um, yeah. campaigns. Yeah, I think there are some very serious issues here. Uh, and there are two problems that I think the politician faces. Um, mm. Firstly, you can take the whole thing in the round, the health of the United Kingdom. And then you get bright people, such as many of we got here in Cambridge, and they will draw out what it is that you should actually uh, be able to deliver. And public health, in fairness to this administration, I'm not exactly complimentary on many things, but they have identified that public health is a major underfunded area in, in, in Britain that actually needs a bigger investment. As always with politicians, they haven't actually told us where that money is going to come from. And they're then moving money from other resources within healthcare, but again, they're not telling us on what basis that's happening, and they're allowing localism to flourish. In other words, anyone can make their own mind up as to what that money should be spent on. You know, should you spend it on Alzheimer's care in the community, or should you actually spend it on uh, other more acute interventions? And there, I've got a serious problem with them. 
Where I begin to feel sorry for politicians, and I, and I genuinely do, because in Britain, whatever people may think of politicians in relationship to uh, the various scandals that, that, that have evaded paragraph, most people in Britain enter politics, whatever their political, because they genuinely want to try and do some good to society. Maybe that's still a naive view of politician, but I think they start off from the right premise. The problem comes for that politician when you're suddenly faced with the individual case that as clinicians we very often are. Maybe as clinicians we're also in a position we can make some judgments at the level of individual care and at what point you begin to withdraw treatment. It is very difficult, particularly when it comes down to an individual case and the politician is faced with why is my daughter, son or whatever being deprived X or Y. And it's very easy for them when, as the Americans say, the rubber hits the road, that they make the decision, of course I've got to care for that particular individual in, in my area. And society will laud them for doing so. Believe me, the Daily Mail will certainly say, what a wonderful person to be doing that. For me to stand up and say, you're wrong, you're totally fundamentally wrong in doing that, isn't going to go down well. And that therefore we're faced in a situation where there is an alliance, if you like, between the the public demand for better care, particularly when it affects them as a group, without thinking of the population as a whole and how best to invest the resources that we've got, and a politician which, who in a democratic system is going to have to face that electorate in four years' time. I can't castigate them for being human, because that's all they're being. The problem is, is somewhere in this tangle, we have to disentangle this if we're going to get a cost-effective system. And you can see what that graph of the Obama expenditure on GDP, where it's heading. And what are you going to do? Spend 30% of GDP? 40%? Where does this stop? The demand is infinite. Um, and, and yet it's difficult to see who is going to be able to take that decision. And what I meant by political suicide is exactly what I said. Give me the name of one Minister of Health in Britain whose political career was enhanced by a period in, in the health service. Every one of them ended in demise. Hello, Lisa Jardine Wright from the Cavendish Laboratory. I wondered if you could perhaps comment on uh, my naive view is that um, all of these things are very intricately linked, so nutrition based yeah. on amount of po population, etc. And we've talked about treating a population in, in whatever form, but could you comment on whether we can control population growth and how that may feed back into the system and perhaps reduce some of the costs and the, uh, improve nutrition, supply, demand, etc. Okay, you can take this in one of two ways. You can take it in the way that Malthus and Darwin actually, uh, and those who actually invented poor houses in Britain took this in the 19th century. Um, you remember the design, if you look historically, the design of a poor house was actually that you separated men and women, boys and girls, because actually you didn't want this underclass breeding. This is where eugenics began to come in. Um, so I don't think that is actually either socially acceptable um, uh, or, or can be driven. The reason for optimism is that while the tendency is for larger families to occur in those countries with high mortalities, it tails off pretty quickly. And what we're seeing in Western Europe and in many countries is a tailing off of the population that will actually, uh, which could... Um, uh, which will itself drive the overall global population downwards. So I'm maybe not as worried about the 9 billion rising to 13 to 14 billion. Frankly, if that happens, as somebody in infectious diseases, I can predict you'll get a plague of one sort or another, and that will carry off the one-third of the population and get you reset the uh, thermostat. What will happen, though, that you do have to be very careful of is that you don't inadvertently change the nature by what, for example, is happening in Shanghai today. That whilst China is promoting a one-child family, already Shanghai is saying, but we won't have the workforce to be able to sustain the dependency in our system. So therefore, under particular political uh, decisions that can be made, we can give you an exemption and you can have two children or three children. Um, how much longer before you can buy yourself the second or third child? And actually, if you believe the eugenic argument, which is completely fallacious, of course, and, and yet in, so in now in politicians, if it's that group that's breeding, it's, not, it's better for the world than if it's the other group that's breeding. You've got some real inequities here, and I think this is the wrong place to start. From my point of view, if you can provide adequate health care 
reduce maternal and, and childhood mortality, there will be a natural reduction in the, the population growth rates. And you can see that growth rate is actually falling quite substantially in terms of, uh, of world growth already. What you can't then have is a situation where you try and, in some artificial way, to limit it either through legal or other constraints uh, on individuals. So I do believe in individual freedom, and I would start the argument the other way. What can we do to prevent that Malthusian crisis by increasing the productivity still further and the adaptation of technology such that we can deal with the peak and then after that um, allow the situation to come to a different equilibrium? So no, I'm not a great fan of going headlong into population control. Uh, David Marks, um, in one of your graphs you, graph you showed uh, the aging population of the world, and you pointed out that China had a severely aging population. And a few graphs later, you showed, um, with some concern, the rise in smoking in China. Uh, and you were critical of that. That seems to be almost a solution to their problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, really raises my, the, the question I want to ask is, do you foresee a situation in which it could be justifiable for a limit on the treatment of the aging part of the population? Uh, I can answer that in two ways. I can see that somebody will try that sooner or later. Do I think it would be acceptable in any circumstances? Sorry, as a clinician, the answer is a fundamental and absolute no for, from my point of view. I, I just find that morally repugnant to me. However, if I can finish on a lighter note, just think of this particular context. Maybe I've castigated Philip Morris and Imperial Tobacco too much. If we all took up smoking at the age of 55, smoked 20 a day, we'd be paying a lot of tax to government. Many of us would die before we reached 70. The reduction on the pensions demand would be fantastic, and the dependency rates would fall dramatically. Maybe smoking is the most socially acceptable thing to do. <laughs> well, on that note, thank you. Well, firstly, I'd like to thank you, Ron, for chairing so ably this evening. And, of course, um, to thank the Vice-Chancellor for a hugely stimulating lecture. And as a small token of our gratitude, um, I have a gift here for you, Vice-Chancellor, um, which gives a uh, history of the hall and the gardens um, for you to peruse at your leisure. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, indeed. So it goes without saying, of course, that um, events such as these don't happen on their own. So I'd like to extend my thanks to my colleagues, without whom we wouldn't be here this evening. I also hope that we'll see many of you back here at Maddingley Hall, um, not only for future Maddingley lectures or Maddingley concerts, but also studying with us. We have about 8,000 student enrolments per year and offer short, non-credit-bearing courses through to accredited undergraduate level and postgraduate programs and part-time master's degrees in subjects um, in professional intellectual, in, sorry, personal intellectual enrichment and also professional development and diversification, um, as well as our international summer schools that bring well over a thousand people to Cambridge each year. So there are lots of different courses that we offer that may take your interest. And I would encourage you to pick up a brochure or two on your way home. You each have a copy of our new Maddingly Weekly Programme brochure on your chair. Um, this is a new portfolio of courses that we're starting in January. So I'd encourage you to have a look at those. And you also have a leaflet that lists all of our courses that are running in the spring term. So in January and February and so on. So please do take them away and share them with your friends and families. The next Maddingley Lecture is on the 30th of January, and that will be given by Professor Simon Goldhill, who's the Director of the University Centre for Research in the Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities, CRASH, and will, he will be speaking on Victorian desire and the classical body. The next Maddingley Concert will be on Sunday the 15th of January, so there are two dates there for your diary. So thank you once again. You'd be very welcome to join us back here for the next Maddingley concert or lecture um, or for a course in the new year. <laughs>